So, several years ago, on a visit to San Francisco, I had the good fortune to meet an unusual character who inspired me to pursue a project that would reach across languages and cultures and touch on science, art, religion, and mathematics. Meet Yasser Shatley. Yasser is a Sufi teacher and scholar, and he dresses the part. He's kind of a Berber fashionista, which is something that seems to go over well in the San Francisco Bay Area. He, he lives in an unassuming house above El Sabrante, California, one of the many satellite communities across the bay from San Francisco. Since our first acquaintance, I've made it a point to visit Yasser whenever I travel to San Francisco, and he fixes us tea, and we proceed to consume long hours in wide-ranging discussion. Um, we tend to ponder over some pretty big questions, the kind of conversations I personally find fascinating. In the end, though, our talks always turn to broad topics of divinity in history and culture. I like to think about myself as a kind of scientific rationalist, but I've found that this topic of divinity can take on many unexpected textures and complexions in both science and art. To start with, we can note that ideas about divinity may well have preceded the appearance of Homo sapiens on the planet Earth. An intriguing case in point is that many Neanderthal grave sites have been determined to be intentional some have been found to contain various humanistic and ritualistic elements, with the cadaver placed in a sleeping or fetal position. A few remains have been found with small animals placed in the hands or near the body, along with red ochre, a colored pigment possibly used for symbolic ritual, just as this same pigment has been used for ceremonial purposes by Homo sapiens for thousands of years. Although many of these Neanderthal interments have been found in different areas in Europe and the Near East, one of the most fascinating and controversial burial sites is this one, the Shanidar Cave in Iraqi Kurdistan. Uh, the remains of one of the grave sites there, called Shanidar IV, were carefully placed in the fetal position on a rough bedding of woven woody horsetail, a type of local plant. According to pollen samples taken, this Neanderthal was interred with several different species of flowers. Um, the accompany, accompaniment of flint tools with the Shanidar burials may also be an indication of Neanderthal belief in an afterlife. The skeleton was found of Shanidar IV was found buried with many different species of flowers and herbs evidenced by pollen remains. It was laid to rest sometime between late May to early July. There were at least eight different species of flowers, mainly small, brightly colored wildflowers. The flowers were apparently woven into a pine-like shrub. The most numer numerous of the flowers were members of the daisy family. The study of the particular flower type suggested that flowers may have been chosen for their specific medicinal properties. Yarrow, cornflower, bachelor's button, St. Barnaby's thistle, Ragwort, groundsel, grape hyacinth, horsetail, and hollyhock were represented in the pollen samples, all of which have been traditionally used as diuretics, stimulants, astringents, and anti-inflammatories. All of this seems to indicate that spirituality is not unique to Homo sapiens. Neanderthals were another species of hominins with larger brains than Homo sapiens, and who are now thought to have been at least as intelligent as their later human counterparts. <coughs> Can I open this? Um, so for context, we can note that in recent years, considerable attention has been devoted to relationships between neuroscience and human spirituality. Proponents of the neuroscience of religion say there is, thank you, say there is a neurological and evolutionary basis for subjective experiences traditionally characterized as spiritual or religious. It turns out that specific parts of the human brain seem to be associated with religious experience. Dr. Andrew Newberg at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia studies the relationships between the brain and religious experience and has scanned the brains of praying nuns, chanting Sikhs, 
and meditating Buddhists. Scientists have tried to stimulate these parts of the brain with rotating magnetic fields produced by a so-called God helmet. The late American Canadian neuroscientist Michael Persinger found that he could artificially create the experience of religious feelings where the helmet wearer reported being in the presence of a spirit or having profound feelings of cosmic bliss. Persinger claimed that about eight in every 10 volunteers reported quasi-religious feelings when wearing his helmet. Evidently, atheist Richard Dawkins' brain was <clears throat> among those not responsive. Um, Persinger's, Persinger's results have been <clears throat> widely criticized, but a technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation using much stronger pulse magnetic fields has shown diagnostic and therapeutic potential in the central nervous system with a wide variety of disease states in neurology and mental health, and that research is still evolving. Later studies found that several areas of the brain are indeed involved in religious belief, one within the frontal lobes of the cortex, which are unique to humans, and in another part called the thalamus, which resides in more evolutionarily ancient regions of the brain that humans share with apes and other primates. Other studies involving the neurochemistry of spirituality point to a family of brain enzymes also associated with religious experience, and on an even deeper level, certain genetic polymorphisms have also been co correlated with spirituality. My in introduction to Yasser Shadli involved our mutual acquaintances with, associated with the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. SETI is an acronym for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And so another one of the topics we discussed was about a hypothetical scenario in which ET receives messages from human beings and responds with a troubling question. Um, Hello? Hello? We're the uh, aliens, and we got your message just fine. We just, we just want to know, we have a, one question, and that is, um, what's all this stuff about divinity? And we'd go, I mean, uh, what would we say? Uh, would we tell the truth? Would we say that we've routinely used altogether trivial and trifling differences of opinion about religion as excuses to slaughter untold millions of our fellow human beings and that we're not finished yet? Or maybe, maybe we just ask them to hold the phone. So as I mentioned, Yasser is a Sufi scholar and uh, we've therefore discussed of course, various aspects of Islam. And at one point, Yasser told me about an ancient practice for making angels, not angels out of paper or cloth or any sort of fabricated angel image or angel representation. Rather, as Yasser's story unfolded, I realized he was talking about a systematic method to make real supernatural angels, spiritual entities said to be automatically created when one utters a certain phrase in Arabic. What's more, this angel making protocol has been around for more than a thousand years. And it makes no difference whether you speak the phrase or write it or cause it to be printed. Anytime the phrase is iterated in any form, you get an angel. The phrase is subhanallah, which translates into the English language word hallelujah, meaning glory be or praise the, praise the Lord. It's a, it's a word that's come to have both religious and more secular meanings. And I can't imagine that really merely repeating this term would be interpreted as at all offensive or disrespectful no matter what language we choose to speak. Now, I realize that anyone with a serious scientific attitude will be inclined to skepticism about all things supernatural, but it turns out that super, supernatural entities may, may be more commonplace than we might assume. 
The human brain appears to construct conscious awareness in an after-the-fact fashion, a phenomena initially noted in 1958. Our consciousness lags 80 milliseconds be behind actual events. That means it takes the human brain 80 milliseconds to construct of what we think of as the present. In other words, when we think an event occurs, it has actually already happened. So these are called light cones. This is how physicists look at, the, look at history and prediction and memory. And, and the present is this tiny interval between memory and prediction. Nobody knows how exactly sm small it is. It must be incredibly minute. Uh, it has to last at least five times 10 to the minus 43rd seconds if the laws of physics are to apply. That's the Planck interval. Uh, but 80 milliseconds puts us somewhere in the cone on the left. So um, you are not here. I mean, I am a figment of your imagination, and you are a figment of mine. Uh, the Earth spins on its axis at 1,037 miles an hour, or about half a kilometer per second. And the Earth orbits around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour. And the sun is also traveling in a nearly circular orbit about the center of the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 447,000 miles an hour, or about 220 kilometers per second. And the Milky Way itself speeds through the cosmos at a blistering 1,300,000 miles per hour. So if we compile all these motions, we find that we are constantly moving through the cosmos at about 390 miles per second. Um, at this moment, therefore, reality is 31 miles away, uh, about 50 kilometers. That's the distance we've traveled in the 80 milliseconds since what we think of as the present has actually been in existence. It's 31 or 50 kilometers away. And the actual present, the one we'll eventually become aware of, is there, therefore also about 50 kilometers away. In this sense, and at this moment, the whole human race is supernatural, very much like the angels. And this is a version of supernatural that happens to agree with thermodynamics. So, if we give Yasser Shadley the benefit of the doubt about the process of making angels, we might wonder how many angels have ever been made in this way. Um, the phrase subhanallah is part of daily prayers in Islamic tradition, so we can make a rough estimate of the number of times it's ever been repeated. A quadrillion is the next illion after a trillion. It's equal to one followed by 15 zeros and equal to a million billions or a thousand trillions, which is pretty insane. That's many more angels than human souls since only about 100 billion people have ever died. It's a pretty big number. We now know that, numbers of, that the numbers of molecules involved in process of molecular biology are even larger, much, much larger. Texts accompanying this often reproduced image claim that about 10,000 gigabytes or 10 terabytes can be stored in the pink smear of DNA at the end of this test tube. It's a photograph from the University of Washington. One gram of DNA can hold at least one billion terabytes or one zettabyte, uh, or eight sextillion bits of data. That's eight followed by 21 zeros, or eight times 10 to the 21st bits of data. So, it occurred to me, with the application of the, a few familiar tools of molecular biology, it might be possible to change the whole demographic of heaven. Harvard professor George Church calculated that if we were to spend $900 on reagents for PCR, we could create 50 quadrillion angels. PCR is an acronym for polymerase chain reaction, a, a laboratory technique for creating large numbers of copies of any given DNA molecule. Um, this seemed to me to be a fascinating project to undertake in quarantine. I went through all of the prescribed training and testing for, for provisional work at the laboratory throughout the pandemic, but given my COVID risk group and the onset of unforeseen medical conditions, my access to laboratories at both MIT and Harvard have been either completely curtailed or extremely limited for more than a year. 
Like many of my colleagues, my laboratory benchtop projects came to an abrupt standstill and remained that way throughout 2020 and well into 2021. But many of our laboratory vendors continued to operate, and they were also limited by effects of the pandemic. Services such as DNA synthesis and sequencing continued to be available with transport to and from the laboratory organized by post or courier. Remote access to online laboratories and research archives have been also available throughout. Still, many of my colleagues and collaborators suddenly found themselves with more time for discussion and creative pursuits than would have ordinarily been available to them in the past. This project soon involved several others, including Sarah Khan, an artist and biologist from Peshawar, Pakistan. Sarah also happens to be the youngest woman in Pakistan ever to teach at university level. One of our first problems was finding references to the SubhanAllah angel making tradition. We had no reason to doubt Yasser Shadley's account, but in good conscience, we, couldn't, we felt that we couldn't proceed based on hearsay alone. Eventually, we found published accounts in manuscripts dating back several centuries. One example by Ibn Nur al-Din al-Abbas were republished narratives from 1735, and these recounted sources of the tradition dating to the ninth century CE. We were able to obtain a 19th century copy of, of al the al-Abbas manuscript from a bookseller in Cairo, and unfortunately, <laughs> we went through all kinds of challenging situations getting here from North America, and as a result, uh, two of our bags were lost, and uh, only one has been returned. And in the one that's still missing are these 19th century manuscripts, sadly. Uh, the practice is also the practice, this angel making subhanAllah connection is also referred to in hadith collections, which are accounts from verbal and physical teachings and traditions dating from the early Islamic era. Although some of these counts have been contested and have not been uniformly endorsed by many religious scholars, persistent narratives about pronouncements of subhanAllah and the appearance of angels have endured for many hundreds of years. The first part of our strategy to convert words, the word subhanAllah into DNA was to convert Arabic language the Arabic language phrase into Arabic language ASCII format, and as some of you probably already know, ASCII is abbreviated from American Standard Code for Information Interchange, which is an international character encoding standard for electronics and communications. ASCII codes represent numbers and textual characters as binary information in computers, telecommunication equipment, and other devices. As you can see in the lower part of this slide, ASCII ASCII character to binary conversions require eight binary bits per encoded character. That gives us subhanAllah encoded as 152 zeros and ones, or 152 binary bits. Converting these binary bits into DNA calls for another encoding step. These are the nucleic acids we call RNA and DNA. Both are ladder-like molecules twisted into helical shapes. The spring-like outer portions of these molecules are chemically identical repeats of sugars and phosphates. The only variable parts are the sequence of structures that make up the rungs of the ladder. These rungs of RNA and DNA molecules are called bases, and we refer to DNA bases by their initials, C for cytosine, T for thymine, A for adenine, and G for guanine. For practical purposes, there are only four kinds of DNA bases, and these are always these always form doubled structures with their complementary bases to form each rung of the ladder. C always joins with G and T with A. Uh, this is, these are the four DNA bases that have, and you can see they have four different masses or molecular weights. And so we can increment them according to size. That mean, this means in, that instead of thinking about DNA bases as initials for chemical names, we can also think about them as numbers such that C equals 0, 0, T equals 0, 1, A equals 1, 0, and G equals 1, 1. I've used the same approach for encoding binary information into DNA since my early DNA encoding projects in the 1980s. So 
Using this strategy, the 152-bit supernova ASCII binary code can be converted into the 76 mer DNA sequence shown here. This is a very efficient coding scheme that contains two binary bits in each DNA base. But there are problems. Repeats of DNA bases in a sequence and subtle embedded symmetries can interfere with DNA synthesis and sequencing. To date, information density of two bits per DNA base has been considered theoretically possible. But when taking into account inevitable DNA reading and writing errors, a maximum of 1.8 bits of data per nucleotide of DNA has been cited as the practical limit. For perspective, information density achieved with DNA fountain encoding, one of the most efficient DNA data encoding methods to date, was 1.57 bits per base, not two bits per base. In any case, we didn't feel that such straightforward encoding was appropriate here. Instead, we thought we might take this opportunity to apply a method for DNA information keeping that resonates with the intricate geometries and overlapping calligraphies of Islamic art. Our method is a recursive encoding scheme that holds the subhanAllah data in several different but simultaneous layers of informational symmetry. We call this method DNA manifolds. So this is my panic button. This is a warning. Uh, what I'm about to explain may seem to be very tedious and complicated. Uh, I can skip it, though. I can explain how DNA manifolds works, if you like. If not, we can jump past it, and you can just take my word for it. It's up to you. Can I see a number of hands? Should I describe this operation? Who would rather I not describe this operation? <laughs> OK, you can leave. <clears throat> All right, you asked for it. Uh, so, to understand DNA manifolds calls for an understanding of some fundamental principles of molecular biology. This is one of my primers for non-scientists. So here is the DNA helix, the double helix. And if you, um, if you flatten it out, you have a kind of railroad tracks. And this is like double-stranded DNA. Uh, and there's this protein complex called DNA polymerase that jumps on the double strand, and it makes a, a copy of one side of that double strand called messenger RNA. So this is information, and then it gets converted into information. And then this, um, this complex of RNA and protein called a ribosome jumps, it's an hourglass-shaped structure, jumps on the messenger RNA, and then there are these, these little RNA guys called transfer RNA. There are 20 different kinds of them because there are 20 amino acids. These are my amino acid drawings. And anyway, they, they grab an amino acid from the matrix and they go running into the ribosome and they have, these, um, have this something called an anticodon, which fits the bases on the messenger RNA, and so when it maps to the bases, the right bases on the messenger RNA, it drops off the amino acid, and the ribosome hooks it to the last amino acid, and the last and last, and the amino acids join together, and they make peptides, and peptides go together, and they make proteins. This is a secret of the universe. This is what biologists call um, the... Say it? The central dogma. Yes, indeed. OK. Um, I want to emphasize that nature itself records information in recursive layers, in this case of RNA and DNA. Um, I made these graphic icons to represent amino acids simply because they were easier for me to deal with when comparing various charts and diagrams and interpreting the standard abbreviations in text form. This could be my own cognitive quirk, I guess. Um, so the relationship between the 20 amino acids, because there are only 20 in general terms, and 64 triplet codons. So DNA codes for one of the amino acids with three bases. And there are only 64 ways you can make three bases out of 
four nucleotides, CTAG. And so the relationship between the 20 amino acids and the 64 triplets is what's called the genetic code. Um, here the DNA triplets are shown in blue and the abbreviations for the 20 amino acids are shown in red. This may seem complicated, but I've made tools that let me teach the operation of genetic code to third graders. Instead of amino acids, I use letters of the alphabet. And instead of DNA bases, I use basic colors. And they created all these beautiful uh, genetically encoded uh, objects. And then they went home and explained the gene. I tell them after the fact that they just learned the genetic code. And then they go home and explain it to their parents. So. Here it is for grown-ups. 64 DNA triplets are shown in blue, and the abbreviations for the 20 amino acids are shown in red. Note that there are only 20 universal amino acids, but there are 64 ways to make triplets from the four bases, and this means that most amino acids are represented by more than one codon. A codon is the triplet. Each amino acid can be represented with anywhere from two to six different codons. When there's a mutation that alters DNA bases but not the corresponding amino acid, it's called a silent mutation. And the first part of the DNA manifold strategy has to do with the method for data encoding using these silent mutations to hold binary information in redundant codons. codons we call this silent code. Silent code assigns binary number values to individual codons according to the respective incremental mass of all the codons that translate for a particular amino acid. Um, okay. You with me so far? So, since even a relatively short protein can be translated from an astronomically large number of distinctly different sequences of DNA, silent code can be used to encode any number within a given gene or set of genes that comprise a given set of amino acids. By itself, silent code is not a very efficient coding technique in terms of bits per nucleotide, but it can be written into highly conserved genes. If the amino acids are given values too, in this case mathematical base 20 values are assigned, then supanala can be coded for in a molecule that simultaneously codes for something else. We have a kind of genetic code where a message can be independently written into a number assigned to a sequence of amino acids, which we call amino code, irrespective of information written into the number assigned with corresponding sequence of codons, or what we call silent code. This is a very flexible coding technique since, as we just noted, even in the case of relatively small genes, astronomical numbers of distinctly different DNA sequences can code for the same sequence of amino acids. Nature has built this functional redundancy into the genetic code, but there is some non-functional redundancy that's up for grabs. It may seem to be an unimportant detail, but in addition to having information of its own, values assigned to amino acids may also be used as a, a check for copying errors. A predictable sequence of amino acids can hold core information while its triplet variants can encode separate data sets. As a given sequence of amino acids is repeated many times, the probability for error increases. So if the core peptide sequence is XYZ, and there is a region with an erroneous peptide sequence, then there will be a high likelihood of errors appearing in the corresponding silent code. Methods for such over-encoding of information are common aspects of electronic and broadcast communications where multiple layers of information are added to guarantee the integrity of information sent or received. So, there are numbers for codons, and there are numbers for amino acids, but there is a third number too, and this is the number that we've already mentioned. It's the number that corresponds with the DNA itself, where C equals zero, zero, T equals zero, one, A equals one, zero, and G equals one, one. So, Every DNA molecule with two or more ba uh, three or more bases uh, can be assigned with three unique numbers, three numbers. And this means that each DNA molecule having three or more bases can hold three arbitrary numbers or three pages of information, and it seems that nature only uses two of them. One page is the DNA, DNA itself, center, and one page is the peptides or proteins it codes for at left, 
And the third page is up for grabs. This we could code, oops, sorry. <laughs> page one is DNA self center. Uh, and another page is the peptides or protein it codes for at left, and the third page at right is up for grabs. In the case of our very short subhanAllah DNA molecule, we weren't particularly interested in the peptide sequence it might code for, so instead we used both the values to, its, to assign to its sequence of amino acids and corresponding set of codon values to simultaneously independently encode two informational inputs in a single DNA molecule. So two of these pages are shown in red in the example given here. The amino code number for binary values of the 76 Murray subhanAllah DNA in line one and the corresponding silent code number holds the same subhanAllah bi binary values in, in line four. The numbers here shown in line one and line four are identical reiterations of the same subhanAllah binary sequence. Both of these numbers are automatically contained in the DNA sequence shown in line three, the T, T, G, T, T, C, G, G, C, T, A, T, A, G, G, et cetera, which when converted to binary becomes the third number of the molecule, which is line five here, 01110, et cetera. Line five is a number automatically inferred from the DNA sequence in line three. Unlike the numbers in line one and line four, the number in line five is a kind of meta number because the other two numbers can be derived from it. By itself, this number, the third number, holds all the information coded into the other two numbers, including the specific sequence of the initially encoded 76 mer DNA molecule. These three pages of information are key to the coding method we call DNA ma manifolds. We've shown how information can be written over itself again and again in the same DNA molecule, but we can use one of these pages of information to code not just input information. Rather, we can use one of these available pages to hold the map of an entirely different molecule, a virtual molecule that is entirely hypothetical, but that's nevertheless precisely described. <clears throat> In this case, information directly encoded on one of the open pages is not ASCII code or picture data or other formats that DNA manifolds are explicitly designed to contain. Rather, it's a map of another DNA molecule, an imaginary one that's coded into the real molecule. We can think about this virtual molecule as another third number, the number that is the molecule itself. And since that number also holds two pages of information, one of these pages can be encoded with yet another molecule, a second virtual molecule that is entirely contained in the first. This process can be repeated indefinitely to create other virtual molecules, and so cascading input data into many layers of encoded information. Such a multi-layer DNA manifold can be systematically unpacked into a set of imaginary but precisely described DNA molecules each one holding two additional pages of information. Only the first sequence is synthesized as a real world DNA molecule, but that molecule can be encoded with the maps of many other virtual DNA molecules and all the information they contain. So we can draw lots of complicated diagrams to try to explain how DNA manifolds work, but I have a 3D model here that might be easier to grasp. Map of another DNA molecule, and this could go on and on, except I ran out of nested boxes. <laughs> okay. um, these manifolds 
since manifolds are about mathematics, all about numbers, I can point out that manifolds don't have to be made of DNA. The same mathematical operations can be used to construct manifolds visually. In this case, as four primary colors encoding one of the fragments of the Greek philosopher Heraclitus, which, wrote, which goes, the Lord whose oracles are at Delphi wishes neither to conceal nor to reveal, but rather to signify. And this is the same manifold made up of 20 mil falcon tubes filled with four different quantities or levels of sand. Musical manifolds are possible too, where musical compositions can be written inside of other musical compositions. This example works with the piano keyboard having 64 keys. These are uh, some of my, some calculations from my lab notebooks in which musical notes assume mathematical functions according to frequency. I made a deck of 64 playing cards too by adding several cards to each suit. Note the color triplet marks on each card. The shortest wavelength blue represents cytosine, green represents thymine, yellow adenine, and the longest wavelength red is used to represent guanine. The four suits are the four columns of codons found in most representations of the genetic code and are assigned colors according to the incremental values, their incremental values of, as playing cards. This makes for a complicated game of poker since manifolds in, in an average hand of cards can sometimes code for more cards than there are in the 64 card deck. Uh, how about coding Ford, Chevys, Volkswagens, and Toyotas? Uh, seriously, you can make manifolds out of anything. In the case of our angel making manifold, we encoded the amino acid and redundant codon pages of just a single molecule. It's a single layer manifold with no ghosts or virtual molecules coded into it. The Subhanallah manifold given here is shown as 86 respective amino acids with Subhanallah binary data in the form of amino code annotated in red. The corresponding DNA codons that hold silent code are shown in blue, and these code for identical Subhanallah binary data. Again, note that the numbers in blue and red are the same number. True to form, George Church came up with a suggestion for yet another numerical modality for encoding Arabic language. Numerological systems of abbreviation are common among Semitic languages, including Arabic and Hebrew. In Ab Arabic, this numerological vocabulary is called abjad, and by this method, a numerical abbreviation is given from which the initial word can be interpreted. Um, in the case of subhanallah, the number is 187. Um, which converts to the sequence 11101110 or Gaga. Lady Gaga should love this. Um, so, uh, amino code in the final 36 codons of the Subhanallah manifold is used to encode 17.5 uh, Subhanallah Abjad or Gaga repeats, shown here in green font. We can also see that the amino code in red is much more efficient at encoding input data than the silent code, but neither as, is as efficient as using both of them together. The SubhanAllah manifold that contains all of this information is a 258-mer DNA molecule. Um, our example is reasonably efficient in terms of maximizing the number of bits that can be stored per DNA base. In this case, two times 152-bit subhanallah texts are encoded as binary Arabic ASCII, as well as 17.58-bit abjad encodings, 140 uh, bits, totaling 444 bits in 258 bases, or 1.72 bits per DNA base. If the two encoded 76 mer DNA sequences and the 70 mer DNA encoding the Gaga repeats are also counted as input data, then Input data total 748 bits in 258 DNA bases or 2.89 bits per base. Either way, our subhanallah molecule is more efficiently encoded than earlier DNA information keeping strategies. Um, remember, ours is now 1.72, but as previously noted, information density achieved with the DNA fountain encoding, one of the most efficient DNA data encoding methods to date, was only 1.57 bits per base. So far as we know, so far as we know, 
Our supernovae manifold DNA demonstrates greater information density than any other information DNA information keeping strategy published to date. And this is how we can hold <laughs> 2.417 billion angels on the head of a pin. Uh, that's 2.417 times 10 to the 18th subhanallahs. Uh, we added linkers to our sequence at the terminal ends, so the final design called for a 301 mer DNA. These extra linkers facilitate in integration with a plasmid, which is a kind of a passenger bus, and also happen to be standard prefixes and suffixes used by the iGEM community, the International, International Genetically Engineered Machine Organization, to create what they call BioBricks, which is a standard genetic module that can be attached to each other, like Legos or Tinker Toys. We hope that this feature will help to enable worldwide distribution of, Subana, of the Subhanala sequence. So in the end, June, Gene Universal, a biotech company in Newark, Delaware, was able to commercially synthesize and sequence our Subhanala manifold DNA in one shot as one gene block. And they also inserted it into uh, PUC57, a plasmid bacterial vector. Um, a plasmid is indeed like a greyhound bus used to ferry exogenous DNA passengers into bacterial cells. The total cost of commercial synthesis of the Subhanala DNA and its assembly with the plasmid was less than $110. And this is remarkably economical since synthesis alone would have cost five or 10 times that amount a few short years ago. Kyle Cromer, my collaborator, oops, ten billion pin, I haven't been, there's the bus. There's the plasmid, the bus. That's Kyle Cromer, my collaborator and former church lab postdoc. Uh, we resequenced the Subhanallah DNA to confirm its accuracy at Stanford University and have now transformed it with new batches of E. coli to grow up additional plasmids that have been, and we've been distributing them to laboratories around the world. Uh, Subhanallah plasmids arrived at Harvard Church Lab in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, we've investigated a number of potential substrates for coding pins with DNA, including gum arabic, cellulose gum, mucilage, hide glue, and fish glue. Common white glue, polyvinyl acetate, would allow iron mo molecules to migrate into the substrate that would damage DNA, and epoxy would destroy DNA bases. So far, fish glue happens to be our best candidate. We've now coded an addition of stainless steel pins with the Supernola DNA. The very first bioart came out of MIT Center for Advanced Visual Studies in the mid 1980s and later from the late Alexander Rich's lab at MIT Biology. These developments have since been celebrated in many international conferences and exhibitions worldwide and cited hundreds of times in scientific literature, but until now, MIT has never acknowledged its role in the foundation of bioart and the later scientific investigations it helped to foster. Times have changed, however, and the first MIT BioArt exhibition is planned to coincide with the opening of a new MIT museum next year at Kendall Square in Cambridge. Sarah Khan and I have been selected to contribute a House of Angels installation to that exhibition. Um, we've entitled our contribution to this exhibition as Betul Mamour, which is a classical Arabic term for house of angels. For this, I had initially planned to weld together an angelarium of sorts to hold one of our pins, but the pandemic and medical issues intervened, so I've now been constructing these mechanically at, in my home workshops. The structure includes one of my very large hand-blown glass spheres, and I expect to integrate onboard lighting and possibly USB sound. Um, the House of Angels structure has been designed to contain a smaller glass globe as a part of an internal assembly holding a magnetically suspended DNA coded pin that is modulated with the traditional Islamic call to prayer. Uh, we've used small, a small Islamic alarm clock as the audio signal source for call to prayer. 
The clock has an audio call to prayer alarm sourced from an internal chip, and we've co-opted that signal to drive the pin modulating assembly. Unfortunately, the Islamic clocks are also in the missing luggage. Tomorrow I'm going to look for MP3 drives um, in local media stores, outlets, to see if I can't hack something together. Matt and I think we can. This is Matt Thomas, by the way. Where is he? Matt. Matt Thomas, uh, my collaborator and uh, friend who's helping me pull all this off and drag everything across continents. We've also been invited to install an exhibit at this month at the newly renovated Anatomy Museum in Riga, Latvia. Uh, furthermore, Sarah Khan and I have been selected to receive an award at Ars Electronica this year in Linz. And so we've built two smaller House of Angel assemblies to contribute to these European exhibitions. These will also contain pins in modulated magnetic fields with optoacoustic detectors so that the pins modulated with call to prayer can be resolved as aud audible sound. In any case, our angels are on the loose. Batches of subhanAllah DNA have arrived at Stanford University, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, University of Kentucky, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon University, Sarah Khan now has them in Pakistan, and Blick, a local biotech firm, is amplifying a batch of angel making DNA here in Jena. Uh, what it seemed at first to be a simple poetic gesture has now come to be a little more complex. We've explored new forms of information keeping in DNA. We've pioneered new expressions of Islamic art in biological form. And while we've lost over one million people to the pandemic in the United States alone, the no notion that we may be helping to create angels could come as a kind of comfort or solace to many whose lives have been disrupted by the terrible impacts of COVID-19. Our project has been about building bridges between art and mathematics, between art and science, science and spirituality, and more. But there's something else. I've mentioned how I've assigned numbers to DNA bases according to their molecular weight. Um, I also use molecular weight as a guide for silent code number assignments. But when I assembled all of these numbers, number sets, together with corresponding molecular weights, I noticed something peculiar. The genetic code contains another group of redundant number sets, an entirely different set of redundant numbers than those associated with silent code. Here I've organized groups of codons associated with these redundant sets of molecular weights and assigned them with yet another set of binary number values. I'm intrigued by this expanding family of numbers based on natural evolutionary relationships. It, DNA manifold seems to have revealed a special kinship between numbers, and I wonder if there's some hidden symmetry among them that we all seem to have missed, a hidden symmetry in mathematics that's still unfolding. And that, of course, brings us right back to the sources of Islamic art. <coughs> there are layers of information under everything around us. One of my favorite examples is the archetype of a sunset on the beach, the beloved subject of romantic painters. We're supposed to regard this grand spectacle with emotional literacy, gathering all the immensity and beauty in one broad sweep, and that's it. That's all the inspiration we need to cultivate our veneration of nature. Never mind that the colors we see come from the spectra of a G-type star, an incredibly violent nuclear furnace operating at this minute 93 million miles away, or that the colors we see are in the awe-inspiring brushstrokes of our impressive display are supplied by the refractive index of atmosphere and the, and the particles suspended there, or that the true majesty and splendor of the event we think we see will always remain imperceptible to the narrow compass of our human sensorium, because the sunset, you see, is happening in invisible wavelengths, too. Perhaps we fail to notice that those rocks on the beach testify to great epics of unknown history, lush worlds full of life and diversity far richer than the one we know, and that the ebb and flow of tides accumulate a record, too, telling 
about a world we wouldn't recognize, a world with long departed seas and vast continents turned to salt and dust. It's about a distant time when the rotation of the earth was different and the orbit of the moon was different than they are today that were, for instance, there were, for instance, 424 days in the Cambrian year. Believe it or not, we can observe all these things by carefully looking at rocks on the beach. All of this, all of this is in that picture too. Somehow, we routinely overlook much of this world despite the fact that it's sitting right in front of us. We have obviously failed to notice that we are all one tribe, one people confronting the harshest forces of nature, the accumulating toll of human impacts on our shared environment, and the terribly violent and destructive impulses that lurk behind what we are often we are all too often given to think of as the best of our intentions. Our SubhanAllah DNA Manifold project operates at many levels, but that part of it that focuses on the, this amnesia of the obvious might just be the most important part of all. Our project about making angels has an obvious subtext about, subtext about helping to mitigate widespread fear and hatred of Islam. Um, and events half a world away have now imparted a special sense of urgency to this aspect of our work. We find ourselves, unfortunately, confronting yet another issue which is much closer to home. This again is my collaborator, Sarah Khan, and there is a problem we didn't foresee at the time we were notified of the award from Ars Electronica. Latvia, Denmark, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Bulgaria, Switzerland, and Austria are among the 16 countries that have enacted laws to effectively prohibit Islamic garments for women. The niqab is not only fundamental to Sarah's sense of piety and modesty, it's part of centuries-old cultural and religious traditions in the Islamic world, and it is, of course, harmless. There's no small irony in the fact that now everyone has to wear masks, too, a paradox. In one form or another, the veil has always been a significant part of Christian tradition, and I don't think we'd get very far telling people to take them off. It would make just as much sense to me to enact laws that would prohibit unusual hats or maybe unnecessary wings. Uh, Sarah Khan is not in Europe right now to receive her award. Um, the, the reason, this is purported uh, to having to do with reasons of public health or terrorist threats, but this can only be ethnic and political. I think Sarah really wants to show us a face. She's shown it to me. It's another face of Islam, one that carried knowledge of science and mathematics and philosophy through the darkest periods of history and is still quite capable of doing so. A tolerant and benevolent face of Islam that we might one day learn something of ourselves. You see, angels are everywhere. SubhanAllah. <laughs>